Hello, I'm Kevin Rayburn with Outer Galaxy Lounge. In the early 1890s, Louisville was the 20th largest city in the United States, with booming industries in tobacco, alcohol, steel, and much more. At the time, the city opened a grand, monumental new federal building and post office on 4th Street downtown to meet its postal and other needs. The city's previous federal building from 1858 on 3rd Street, though grand in its day, was no longer big enough to meet the city's growing mail and governmental service demands. So in late 1885, construction of a new and bigger federal building got underway near South 4th Street, back when that was still a relatively sleepy residential part of town. The building was only supposed to take five years to build, but construction dragged on for various reasons, and the never-ending delays became a running joke among citizens and the city's press. Finally, in spring 1892, government employees moved into the monumental new structure, variously known as the Federal Building or the Post Office and Custom House. A mere 40 years later, the building was shuttered. It had already become obsolete as the city's service needs grew and a bigger facility opened on Broadway and 6th, which still stands and is in use as a federal building today. Meanwhile, the old 4th Street Federal Building fell into disrepair and decay during the Depression and, in the middle of World War II, was demolished. A demolition manager on site at the time, in 1942, said the overbuilt old federal building had more material inside it, more granite, marble, steel, iron, copper, and wood than he had ever seen in any building. Much of the building's metal was put into war production to make parts for planes and ships and ammunition. At the time, the building was considered an eyesore, an ugly, soot and bird feces cake glowering roost for the city's masses of birds. And most of the city's leaders, retailers and citizens were glad to see it gone. But there were a few lone voices in the public with a different opinion at the time. People with a more European view that public buildings are public art, that tradition should stand for something that something well made is something that should stand and be reused, that the current taste would change, that the old would be reappraised and reappreciated. A writer at the time predicted that the city and its people would regret the destruction of the federal building, and as the years have passed, along with so many of the city's architectural treasures, that prediction seems to have come true. Many people, me included, have formed an abiding love for the old federal building, a building most of us have never seen except in old pictures. The late Louisville urbanist Brandon Clayco called the old post office and federal building the finest building to ever be demolished in Louisville. In this film, I hope to give you some idea of what has been lost. Sometimes when I'm in this quiet place, I whistle. Sometimes I make a little racket. 
Sometimes I just get quiet and tiptoe out of respect. This place gets lonesome nowadays, this grand old lady. That's why I come over here every Friday morning to keep her clock ticking and keep her company. To climb the clock tower rail and wind her up and keep her going. Nothing sadder than a stop clock, I think. My name is Frank J. Doss. I'm a foreman over at the new federal post office on Broadway, a couple of blocks west of here in the city of Louisville, Kentucky. It's a pretty good place to work, big and roomy. They opened it a, the new place a, a year or so ago, and she's a good building, a city block big, as grand in her way as this old one used to be. Well, I used to work over here in this place, and truth be told, as much as I like her, she got out of date for all the mail and business this city needs to do. But in her day, she was the pride of the town. Some of us still care for the old building. That's why me and a couple other fellas in the past couple of years have volunteered to keep the clock running. We do it for free. The feds don't want to put no money into her anymore. The people out on the street going to work or shopping on Broadway or 4th Street still look up to the old tower and I feel like it sort of cheers them up to look up and see it still running. There is something a little depressing about coming into an empty building like this, but I don't know, maybe I'm a sentimental sort. Some of us still care about this old building. And really, she ain't that old. Forty years? The way they built it, it could last a thousand. It's almost a sin they built a building as solid as the pyramids in the middle of Louisville and can't find any way to use it anymore. There's talk of tearing her down, and I sure hope that doesn't happen. It's amazing how quiet it is up here. You can't even hear the noise from the street. It is kind of ghostly in here, especially since there used to be such a hubbub of people. I don't know how many millions walked through these corridors, but it surely was a lot. Now the only things living in here are pigeons and starlings up in the tower, and rats as big as cats in the basement. I don't fool around with them. Well, I do get a little winded, especially after a hard night shift. Climbing the five flights and the spiral staircase and then working the weight to get the clock going up here. But it's only once a week, and anyway, it's like what you call it a kind of meditation. It's quiet, and all I hear is my own breath, and the sound of the cooing and flapping pigeons. I think they might be my friends, because they don't panic too much when I'm around. I don't have no idea how those birds get in here, and then they just fly off and out through a secret exit of their own. Kentucky, 1892, a rough and tumble city on the Ohio River, a century old. A mighty canal has tamed the waterfalls that made people settle here in the first place. Dirty and dainty, corrupt and genteel, backward and progressive, self-conscious and self-confident. It's an up-and-comer, growing fast. 231,000 citizens in 1890, one of the 20th largest cities in the USA at the nation's statistical population center. A city in its golden era of prosperity, as the local paper brags, the Louisville Colonels baseball team brought home a championship. Bicycle races of the rage. Daisy Bell is the big song hit. The city flexed its prowess in giant industrial expositions. All the rage in the Gilded Age, or any town that could muster up one, all lit up in electric lights. Union Station just opened on Broadway. Grandest rail terminal in the South. A dozen rail lines run through it, including the mighty l &N, the Louisville and Nashville. 25 million passengers ride the city streetcars a year. It's the South's first city run on natural gas. 1,350 factories churn out 65 millions in goods. The city is the nation's fifth largest maker of iron, famed for horses, bourbon, tobacco, and southern charm, the self-proclaimed gateway to the south. The city's businessmen and the commercial club have built like lightning a 10-story skyscraper, tallest in the south, soon known as the Columbia Building. 
Not a trace of the devastating F4 tornado that ravaged downtown in 1890 remains. This can-do city cleaned it fast and moved on. A city with rough edges, trying to cultivate a civic culture. Market and Main Streets are retail titans, but 4th Street is making a play to join them. Racial injustice, crime, political corruption, worker exploitation, Louisville has its fair share. Boss Whalen, Whiskey Man, and Burlesque King rules the local political machine. A man with a dangerous charm, the classic ward boss. Louisville's a stop on the Grand Circuit. Mark Twain, Oscar Wilde, Opera Diva, Adelina Patti. Only the best grace the city's elegant stages. Ex-boxing champ John L. Sullivan stops by to act in a melodrama and regale his fans with stories at the old Boston Saloon on 4th Street. Gambling is going on upstairs, but nobody's supposed to talk about that. Newfangled gramophone music machines at saloons and hotels in town dispense music for a nickel. Down in the genteel part of town, 3rd Street, well-heeled industrialist families like the Theodore Aarons are entertaining their society friends with music from the new talking machines. Louisville has been running, but now it wants to walk a little bit, and it expects the best. After the Civil War, American cities like Louisville grew fast, and so did the federal government. Their buildings had gotten too small to serve the public. Louisville's old federal custom house on 3rd Street that opened before the Civil War in 1858 had been grand in its day, but now it was cramped. Back then, a handful of postal clerks were enough, but now the city needed more than a hundred. All told, a new federal building was needed for 500 workers, and the new federal buildings being built across the nation were grander and more ornate. They had lofty ideals about government back then, that the people's business should be done in a place of dignity and grandeur, and Louisville wanted a building that said that nothing second-rate or puny. The present building, a local news writer stated, is not suitable for the needs of a great, growing, progressive 19th century city like Louisville. Louisville was especially in need of a sizable federal building, being the epicenter of tobacco and whiskey. Millions of dollars in tax stamps for bonded product would be handled there, and the federal agents in charge of law enforcement of same would operate out of it. 
The ball got rolling in 1880 when Kentucky Congressman Albert S. Willis pushed it. By spring 1882, he obtained the first of an eventual $1.2 million in funds for it. Meanwhile, debate raged about where the building should go. Money men was something to gain, all had their ideas. But in the end, the quiet south end of 4th Street above Broadway was picked by consensus. It was a mostly residential area back then, but it was rapidly going commercial. The beloved old exhibition hall of the original 1872 Industrial Exposition still stood at that spot, but it would have to go. Many old-timers fondly remembered the place, the times they skated there on ice blades or on wheels, or danced on its cavernous rink to the music of Professor Eichhorn's band. $150,000 was spent to buy the old exposition site. After it was cleared, ground was broken for the Federal Building in July 1884. It was supposed to take no more than four to five years to build, but as it happened, it took nearly eight, and tried the patience of all involved. In Washington, D.C., James G. Hill, supervising architect of the U.S. Treasury, started planning the new building project. Soon he was out, and Mifflin E. Bell became the next supervising treasury architect, credited as the primary author of the building's design, taking his influence from the late treasury architect Amy B. Young. A team of draftsmen in the treasury department worked out the designs. It was a time of elegance and grace married to technological prowess. Louisville's new federal building would combine all of that. After what seemed like ages since its construction began, the post office on its first floor was finally opening that spring. She'd been a long time coming, but there she stood, hard to ignore, a mountain of a building built with a mountain's worth of material. The Custom House and Post Office, the Federal Building of the United States in Louisville, Kentucky, at 4th and Chestnut Streets. Louisvillians by now were familiar with her exterior features, curious to see it inside. It was a four to five year project that would stretch to eight. Postal employees laboring in the cramped conditions of the old 3rd Street Building were eager to move in the week before the Kentucky Derby. The story of how she was built and why it took so long is part of its history. People forget that part of the legacy. Politicians came to give speeches to a crowd of 6,000 when the cornerstone was laid on October 2, 1886. Louisville's Mayor Booker Reed, notable Senator John Sherman, and Congressman Albert Willis, who'd pushed the project, spoke. Willis quoted French architect Violette Leduc in stating that, quote, Civilization has no exponent more sensitive than architecture, unquote. That said, a time capsule containing some papers and a bottle of Louisville bourbon, allegedly, were sealed into the stone. Willis made it clear that the building was intended to stand indefinitely to weather the storms of the nation's politics and swings of taste. 
to remain a solid rock through it all. In his notions of high ideals, he couldn't fathom the crass indifference of the 20th century man. The Treasury Department architects at this time favored an architectural style that came to be known as Renaissance Revival, a catch-all of European styles all rolled into one. Massive columns, arches, mansard roofs, porticos, clock towers, made of marble, granite, brick, terracotta, iron, and copper. Hard and heavy stuff. And fireproof, at a time when big city fires were common and devastating, aimed to protect the millions of dollars of mail, documents, and tax stamps inside. The buildings were big and solid, monumental, solidly footed to the street and soaring like monoliths. Federal buildings, wrote one architect at the time, should grab attention and be made of the best materials with skilled workmanship. They should be massive, powerful, leonine, and last forever. All of these qualities would go into Louisville's post office and custom house. Louisville had never before seen an interior atrium with a wide open center court and roof skylight. It would have seemed strikingly modern. A few years later in 1898, a secondary lower skylight of iron frames and glass was placed over the first floor postal area, further filtering the natural light. In this image, that feature is covered by a temporary floor placed over it for a special event in 1901, but at the bottom of this image of Detroit's old federal building, you can see how Louisville's lower skylight would have looked. Here's an exterior view of the skylight. Outside, one would be struck by the building's monumental features. Large porticos leading into the building, topped by massive 10-ton limestone Corinthian columns. On top, a French-style mansard roof with dormer windows. Capping it all was a Gothic-inspired bell and clock tower, with a spire and an odd ship-style mast lookout feature, a quirky touch that for some was an acquired taste. The building ostensibly was only five floors high, but those floors and the ceilings were disproportionately tall. The building stood nearly as tall as some ten-story buildings nearby. This grandiose but impractical use of space eventually led to a two-story courtroom having its ceiling lowered 15 feet to create more third-floor office space. This shot from 1898 shows a disproportionately high window in Postmaster Thomas Baker's office. This image shows how small pedestrians appear compared to the window sizes. The building's tower was not as tall as the Cathedral of the Assumption's 300-foot spire on 5th Street, but close. It was higher than the 13-story Starks building later built down the street. Upon completion in 1893, the federal building was Louisville's tallest non-church structure. The building's clock does appear to have been placed higher than the cathedral's clock, though, making it the city's highest timepiece. Its translucent dial faces were lit at night for all to see. The bell in the belfry tolled on the hour, but accounts tell us no more than that. Outside, the pediment carvings featured symbolic human figures that represented idealized versions of justice, agriculture, commerce, and so on. The elaborate statuary that was supposed to top them, shown in Mifflin Bell's original drawings, were never made. German artist Frank Engelmann and two colleagues carved the pediments, first modeling them in a studio and then carving them while suspended on a scaffold high on the building. The two main entrances, stone staircases within projected pavilions, faced 4th Street on the west and Chestnut around the corner to the south. Guthrie Street bounded the block on the north and 3rd Street on the perimeter to the east. The building fronts were roughly 200 feet long. The main entrances had revolving doors. Stairwells were on the northwest and southwest corners. Passenger elevators were across from the southwest stairs. The marble stairs were 8 feet wide and the stairwells 20 by 36 feet, very large for a Louisville building at the time. 
In the center area, the steam and electric engine plant powering the building was in the basement. Above that, the first floor post office space, accessed by the two entrances, was divided by railings and wooden screens for postal services. There were letter writing tables in the lobbies. The lobbies inside the two main entrances led into the center court. Above that was the skylight. The walls throughout the building were lined with intricate and costly wood trims. There were fine ironwork railings, brass rails, plate glass in all the windows, finely carved marble fireplaces. The ground floor was made up of stone tiles 12 inches square laid in a black and white checkerboard. The mail would be received and exit the building on the third street side relayed into the large sorting room. The customer service windows, P.O. boxes, and other public services were on the perimeters of the first floor. Additional behind-the-scenes mail functions and storage were in the basement. As virtually no photos are known to exist of the interior, we have to imagine it based on photos of similar buildings. Studying this rare photo carefully, we gain precious ephemeral peaks into the lost space. This is possibly the southwest stairwell. You can see some of the columns. Across from the stairs here may possibly be the elevators. The building was made of the best materials from far and wide. The roof was made of copper. The courtrooms had 10-foot high wainscoting made with Tennessee and Italian marble. The basement was built of massive slabs of granite from the quarries of Winsboro, South Carolina, and the limestone for the columns, along with other building stone, came from the quarries at Bedford, Indiana. The brick was made in Louisville at the Ohio Valley Press Brick Works. Well over a million bricks made up the walls. Iron for the superstructure came from the Dearborn Foundry at Chicago. A year after groundbreaking, construction got underway on June 22, 1885, with the excavation work. Everyone believed the building would be ready by late 1889. That, as it turned out, was optimistic. Harry P. McDonald of Louisville's McDonald Brothers architectural firm was named construction supervisor and he kept things moving for four years. He ordered a fence put up around the site and it drew bitter complaints for years from pedestrians who were forced to walk around it on the other side of 4th Street. The excavators of Louisville's Bannon & Company run by Martin J. Bannon took pickaxes and shovels and cleared 16,000 yards of earth in 42 days, leaving a hole 210 feet square and 10 feet deep. It was horses and hands that did the work. Foundation concrete was laid in November. Granite and brickwork in the basement took a year. Superstructure work got underway in early 1886. George Hertz's Louisville-based Ohio Valley Press Brick crew of 100 men laid brick for the next two years. Chicago's Dearborn Foundry Company completed the first floor ironwork in August. The first floor stonework went quickly, completed two days before Christmas 1886. Louisville Sneed and Company did the second floor ironwork. A writer at the time pleased by the progress, floridly waxed rhapsodic. The new custom house is springing from the waves of the strong arms and hammering chisels into a form as beautiful as Aphrodite. Second floor ironwork was completed May 6, 1887. The third, fourth, and fifth floors were completed June 12, 1888. In June 1887, the massive heavy columns on the porticos facing 4th Street and Chestnut Street were hoisted into place by crane-like derricks with surprising ease and dispatch. Construction accidents were minimal but happened. In October 1887, workers Pat Tucker and Mike Brennan were killed when a rope snapped and dropped a hoisted derrick onto a beam below. In 1890, a drunken man walked on sight and fell into the cellar, suffering a head injury. The newest treasury man, Colonel William A. Frerick, tried to cut costs by putting on a flat wooden roof, but Louisville's congressman, Asher Carruth, would have none of that, and he got his way. It would be a splendid mansard roof sheathed in terracotta as planned.
As plumbing and interior work proceeded in 1889, Harry MacDonald was replaced as supervising architect by Louisville's Dennis Xavier Murphy of Murphy Brothers Louisville. Political reasons were cited for the change. By late 1889, the roof was on, the skylights in, and interior woodworking and plastering underway. Hopes were for a summer 1890 opening, but, like many project deadlines to come, it came and went, and people were growing impatient. As one pundit opined, the average citizen, as he passes by on the opposite side of the street and pauses to view the massive proportions, may ask himself, how long before this thing will be finished? By early 1890, Supervisor Murphy conceded that work was going slower than he'd prefer. Tiling Superintendent J.A. Hammett hired more plasterers to speed things up. A walkout of carpenters over pay and hours in May 1890 didn't help. The issue was settled in a month, but it slowed things down. Shortly after, two varnishers attacked a foreman over a pay cut and beat him up squarely. Clearly, there was lingering discontent. Plastering work fell behind, and the more intricate work took time. More than 100 men were hard at work, but the local newspaper still called it snail-like progress. The summer 1890 opening didn't happen. Carpenters and plasterers were waiting around smoking pipes, waiting for the plumbers to lay their pipe. In early 1891, the federal government deluged with projects had not awarded contracts for elevators and heating and lighting. Frank Engelman started the pediment carvings in February 1891. The newspaper complained about bureaucracy, but the draftsmen in Washington were plenty busy, up to their ears in federal projects all over, including the higher priority Ellis Island station in New York. Everybody was overworked, but everybody had a finger they could point for blame to. Deadlines were moved again to fall 1891, then January 1892. Contracts for steam heating and mechanical ventilation wouldn't come till fall. Talk was for another year of work. As one writer put it, this has been the song that has been sung into the ears of the people of Louisville for several seasons. Pressure was mounting, and with the upper floors still unfinished, it was decided to get the post offices opened on the first floor. On April 23, 1892, postal employees vacated their old 3rd Street offices and started moving in, carrying as much furniture and papers as they could. It was made official when a postal worker named Sims bought the first stamp, money order, and envelope on April 24th. The public arrived that May to size up the place, to complain about it or to praise it, as the courts, tax offices, and other agencies opened over the next year well into 1893, they'd gripe about the elevators put in by the Crane Company of Chicago, which didn't work half the time. When the Weather Bureau's wind vane was placed atop the Spire Tower in late December 1893, the building could finally be said to be complete. office and custom house provoked mixed feelings from the get-go and in some ways that persisted for years it was big and imposing and as air pollution stained it it became downright scary looking on the outside and the building did give its users and workers scares at first for one thing it became overcrowded almost instantly just like the former building had the same old problem of too many agencies and too many people the planners of the 1880s had not foreseen the growing needs of the coming century. The elevators caused vexation. They were too small and slow and workers got injured trying to fix them, including one fellow who fell down the shaft. And they only operated from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. That is, when they worked, which they often did not. 
In the rush to finish the building, its flaws emerged. The skylight glass was prone to come loose and rain down on postal workers below, putting them in constant fear. But repairs were successfully made and a secondary skylight was put over the work area in 1898. Aesthetically pleasing and safer, so it was said, many renovations and changes were made through the years to desperately keep the building up to date. Electric lights replaced gas ones in 1898, the same year the lower skylight was put in. The hated elevators were replaced with better ones in 1910. Changes were made all through the 1920s. In spring 1894, just two years after the building had opened its doors, a writer for the newspaper had already declared it out of date. Panels, casing, and doors were showing signs of cracks and warpage. This was to become a theme and perception that plagued the building for the next several decades. It seemed that, from the get-go, people had it out for the place. Through it all, a series of postmasters came and went, most earmarked for political careers. Congress, the mayoralty, whatever. Favoritism, political jockeying, various forms of corruption. The post office had its share through the years. But the place offered opportunities. For black Louisvillians, the post office was one of the city's few decent job options. By the turn of the century, about 40 black workers had positions at the post office as clerks and letter carriers. Discrimination and low pay, though, did not go away. The Federal Building in Louisville was the city's most visited building, and citizens from all over the state had business there, some willing and some not. A writer in 1904 estimated that a quarter million postal customers, taxpayers, criminals, you name it, had come through the Federal Building's revolving doors. Some of them had never even seen a revolving door before, including many rural moonshiners brought into the building's courtrooms by internal revenue lawmen. It was said that tobacco spit stained the walls in parts of the building when the chewers missed the spittoons. Bootleggers, opium dealers, so-called white slavers, postal thieves, steamboat captains who'd run their ships aground. The cases were as many as the people. Most, though, were brought into the courts for more mundane crimes, tax violations, and the like. People selling illegal liquor and even illegal oleomargarine. During the alcohol prohibition era of the 1920s, the building was the headquarters for prohibition enforcement in Kentucky and Tennessee. In 1899, famed Louisville writer and humorist Irvin S. Cobb got a scoop when he found the deposed governor of Kentucky, William Taylor, holed up in hiding at the Louisville Custom House after his implication in a murder scandal. But the ebb and flow of the place was more of the history of ordinary lives. People paid their taxes, bought war bonds, tried to beat the Christmas postal rush, and the nation's sons volunteered for war or showed up for draft inspection there at the building's military recruitment centers. During 1917 and 1918, the mighty Camp Taylor, a few miles away with its tens of thousands of recruits, generated massive amounts of mail for Louisville's post office, including, no doubt, letters from a fellow named F. Scott Fitzgerald stationed there. The writer was fond of the Sealback Hotel and its bar located just a few blocks from the Custom House. Whenever a major citywide celebration was held, the Federal Building always played its part, decorating itself up in banners and billboards and the like. Giant reunions of Union and Confederate Civil War veterans were popular events in the city at the turn of the century. The Confederate Army reunion of May 1900 was one of the biggest. The post office exterior was gussied up with flags and giant pictures of Robert E. Lee and other Confederates. Thousands of visitors and locals crowded the streets for such events and the parades that came with them. The Knights Templar Order of Masons event in July 1901 saw the post office building festooned inside and out with festive bunting and special exhibits. For years, the city's 4th Street parades, including the yearly appearance of Santa Claus, had the Custom House as a backdrop. Christmas mail and packages in the millions passed through the building. Here's a rare image of a lined-up crowd there in 1923. The tiny Lincoln Park on the building's north side was the site of many events, including a women's suffrage rally there in 1915. 
Through the 1920s, a giant movie screen was hung on the north wall of the Custom House on Election Day to flash election results projected off a so-called tele-autograph machine. Thousands showed up to watch it. All of human drama took place at the Custom House. Outbursts and crying and pleadings for mercy in its courtrooms. Pickpockets hanging round the first floor sizing up easy marks. Men and women flirting through the glass of the revolving doors. Pickup artists loitering in the lobby getting slapped. Old people carelessly knocked down dress trains caught under the revolving door. Ink from the wells ruining good suits. And misunderstandings that ended up in marriages. The mysterious woman in black who came to the post office every day in 1921 awaiting a letter that never came. People from all over Kentucky had business there one time or another, good and bad memories made. A writer at the turn of the century, moved by the hubbub, the sights, sounds, and smells of the building, wrote, In the afternoon, when business was heaviest, a peculiar atmosphere seems to hang around the doors. It is a rarefied atmosphere, and within the charmed circle, life seems to take on a different aspect. By 1925, the congestion at the federal building had become acute. The government was spending too much money to house agencies in off-site buildings, defeating the purpose of having a central building. The city's population was pushing 400,000, and mail volume was swamping the place. The building was barely over 30 years old, and already they wanted to abandon and replace it. Whether benign or malicious, a pointedly negative narrative had already begun that would be used to justify the building's destruction. That narrative began in 1926 when Congressman Maurice Thatcher deemed the building too small for its purpose. Not content with that though, Thatcher added a swipe at the building itself. The post office building is of the old-fashioned type, with great rooms and high ceilings, it covers a vast but rather gloomy court in its center. The local newspaper quickly picked up on this line of denigration. It's an ancient custom house, the writer wrote, about the 34-year-old building. Thatcher's bill to sell the building in 1926 went nowhere, but it got the ball rolling, and the public was starting to add its own two cents. In 1928, citizen S.B. Richardson wrote to the newspaper, if the post office must move, it can't be just for the sake of greedy businessmen. A national infrastructure bill in 1929 allotted more than $2 million for a new federal building in Louisville. Despite the stock market crash and looming economic hardships, plans proceeded and Treasury Department architect Martin Eskrand arrived in Louisville in spring 1930 to survey the proposed site for the new building at 6th and Broadway. In 1931, the first concrete was poured for it, and the building went up fast, getting done ahead of schedule, in contrast to its so-called ancient ancestor. The new building was a hit, sleek, clean, impressive, and modern, even with its classical stylings. People praised it as exquisitely beautiful. By 1932, employees were vacating what was now called the Old Federal Building on 4th Street for their new digs on Broadway. Everyone was putting the old place, old as in 40 years, out to pasture. What would happen to the old federal building, and who could even decide? The city and the feds both had a stake in how things went, and both had various rights and say in the matter. For now, it would be shuttered, but everyone with a pulse, it seemed, had an opinion on what to do with it. The public suggested many things, a place for the homeless, a nursing home, a recreation center for servicemen, a museum, a retail space. All of these and more were bandied around and all rejected. Many people who'd grown fond of and dependent on the clock on the high tower to help set the pace of their day became concerned about it. 
The federal government had no intention of paying for its upkeep. For a while, Louisville watchmaker Adolf Schwartz kept it going, but when his contract ran out, volunteers offered to step in. Their help was rejected. Postal employee Frank J. Doss, who had worked in the old building and who was now a foreman at Broadway, was given permission to keep the clock going for a while. He performed that duty into 1934, but after a while, the timepiece was stilled. That year, 1934, Treasury Department inspectors toured the building to see if it could be used. They decided it was too antiquated. But for a short time, the old girl still had some life in her. For a couple of years, various trade shows open to the public were held in the building. This map of the 5th Annual Refrigerator Show in March 1934 shows the first floor layout of the event there. For a brief, glorious time, just like in its heyday, the building was decorated again with bunting and banners and throngs of people. The last show in the building was a radio and appliance show in October 1934. 30 appliance dealers showed their wares to thousands of visitors. Shortly after the last person left the show on Saturday, October 13, 1934, the old post office and custom house was shuttered for good. Its only inhabitants now would be rats, birds, vandals, and trickling rainwater that would rot away the fine woodwork inside. The U.S. Treasury Department issued its death sentence in June 1935. The building would be raised due to its, quote, antiquity, unquote. The building was 42 years old. For the next seven years, the public debated the merits and demerits of keeping or destroying the building, many giving moving and spirited defenses of it. While this went on, though, the building was quickly going to seed. The plate glass windows were shattered, the skylight was falling in, plaster constantly fell inside the court and offices, kicking up dust that made people think the place was on fire. The clocks on the tower were sagging, and one even fell off the building. Floorboards were rotting. Starlings and pigeons, thousands of them, had begun roosting in the ruins. Citizens of 4th Street complained about the torrent of bird feces raining down on their heads. To the city's press, the place had become the butt of jokes. It was ugly, gloomy, oppressive, a hive of pests, a city embarrassment. It had no place on the city's proud avenue of commerce, 4th Street. In 1937, the city went to war with the starlings roosting in the building, sending the Louisville Fire Department in to spray the birds with high-powered hoses. The birds were too smart and evaded these tactics. The firemen admitted defeat and retreated. Although the Ohio River flood that year did not substantially touch the building, the firemen's escapade with water aided in the building's rapid deterioration. The great debate, one that still goes on today in Louisville and elsewhere, continued over the federal building. It was arguably the first time a preservation consciousness was emerging in the city. Opinions differed, of course, and one letter writer to the editor in 1934 exemplified attitudes that would prevail in the city's leadership for years to come. He wrote that the old post office should be demolished and turned into a parking lot. His opinion, though, was not universal. Despite his and the views of the editors at the Courier-Journal, who were never short of pejoratives about the building, calling it an eyesore, a white elephant, a funeral ruin, a blemish in the heart of the city, and a bird roost, there were citizens who could see the diamond in the rough. Some took the economic view that tearing down the place made no financial sense. One reader said its demolition would be an economic blunder. It served for 40 years and can serve 40 more. Along those lines, another wrote, This building cost $1 million in the 1880s and 90s. The stone, marble, tile, slate, and copper put into it are as good today as ever. Others took an aesthetic view. One reader who called himself Uncle George was particularly passionate. I was startled and grieved the other day to hear the plans for tearing down this beautiful building. I recall when it was erected that it was looked upon as one of the best built and one of the most artistic structures in all the land. 
I felt like requesting the mayor proclaim a day of mourning because of such a sad tragedy. If the authorities will delay this destruction, I guarantee that in a few years, the wisdom of saving it will be obvious to everyone. Under its dirt and grime, another wrote, is a magnificent structure, eloquent of its style and era. Through the 1930s, the pleas to save the building read like poignant epitaphs. Reader Lorena Callahan in 1939 wrote, It took Albert Willis ten acts of Congress to get the building built, and it should be preserved. It would be a desecrating act of vandalism to destroy it. Wallace Hughes, another reader, perhaps said it best when he pinpointed the crassness of prevailing attitudes. The old post office building has been a victim of the familiar American trait to make fun. Its architecture has been ridiculed by experts. It has its weaknesses by classical standards, but it is expressive of the America of its generation. It has played a brave part in giving flavor and loftiness to 4th Street. Many who call for its destruction would miss it most. Even so, the Courier-Journal doubled down. An editor there wrote in spring 1940, It is splendid that headway is being made in Washington toward demolition of that 4th Street eyesore. Nobody will be sorry to see it go, excepting perhaps the starlings. Such a sepulchral bird roost in the heart of our shopping district is a source of shame. When the federal government sold the property to the city in 1940, the issue was now in the hands of Louisville Mayor Wilson Wyatt. Wyatt was a consummate politician, and he tried at the very least to appear to listen. On one side, he had a passionate vocal minority who wanted the building saved, on the other, those who wanted the eyesore gone. The merchants of 4th Street were among that group. Wyatt pleaded for the federal government to make use of the building, but the die was cast. When World War II came to America, the mayor had the excuse he needed to give his blessing for the demolition. The building could be used for war scrap. It seemed a fair deal at the time. After all, who could argue against that? Accounts vary on the exact tonnage of materiel in the building. The estimated amount of metal in the structure varied from tens of thousands of tons to millions. Inside, it was a treasure mine of copper, brass, bronze, lead, iron, and steel. Knowing this, the salvage company did the work virtually for free for the high-grade stone, wood, and metal inside. It was an easy sell when officials claimed that so many weapons could be made from it. 250,000 50 caliber machine guns, 2,000 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, or 750 light tanks, or almost two cruisers. A month before the demolition, one of the old-timers, Philip Hutty, who had chiseled the building's beautiful columns back in the 1880s, spoke to the newspaper. I put my heart into every stroke and hate to see it come down. I've been in 17 large cities and worked on a lot of buildings, but that post office is the grandest building I've ever seen. With that, Philip Hutty donated his old chisels, hammers, and cutting tools for war scrap.
In May 1942, a reporter took on the morbid task of examining the corpse of the old post office and custom house. Its condition, in just one decade of disuse, was shocking. Before the reporter was allowed in, a guard holding open the entrance door told him to stay outside for a few minutes to let the building air out a little bit. Once inside, the reporter was hit with a putrid wave of fetid air. What he saw, as he said, was one vast, crumbling, sodden, stinking mess. When you burrow into the place from the warm sunshine outside, a wave of nausea and clamminess sprays over you. The reporter compared it to an old mansion where a reclusive dowager might live, forgotten by time and care, waiting for death. He continued, All about you, you see the remnants of the grandeur that made the post office building a showplace a half century ago. Marble halls and stairs, fine ironwork railings, brass rails, plate glass in the windows, finely carved marble fireplaces, all crumbling, rusting, rotting, under layers of bird droppings and with the smell of dead things, and wet plaster and molding woodwork all over. It had declined so fast, from both benign and malicious neglect. That fall, its final destruction began. Louisville was an industrial juggernaut during World War II. Every institution and factory was working for the war effort. The famous bourbon distilleries converted to making industrial alcohol. Hundreds of millions of gallons of it converted to vital synthetic rubber and explosives. DuPont, B.F. Goodrich, National Synthetics, Jeff Boat, the Naval Ordnance Plant, American Air Filter, Reynolds Metals, Curtis Wright, Tube Turns, Boat Machine, Ford Motor, all of them, and more, were churning out massive tonnages of war vehicles, weapons, parts, and ammo. A hundred thousand Jeeps came out of Louisville and so did 195,000 tons of synthetic rubber during peak production in 1944. On Thursday, December 7, 1944, three years to the day since America was plunged into the war, a forgotten movie premiere happened at the majestic Rialto Theater on 4th Street. The new 20th Century Fox splashy wartime musical comedy Something for the Boys hitting the screen starring the Brazilian bombshell Carmen Miranda. Song and dance, comedy, romance, and patriotism. A movie set in Kentucky, ostensibly, but in it there was only one five-second shot that actually showed the state. Louisville, in fact, and more remarkably, 4th Street, shot only yards from the Rialto itself, where the new movie on screen was playing. The shot, taken before fall 1942, gives us an exceedingly rare color view of 4th Street, but even rarer, of the post office and custom house the only known color image of a building that no longer existed by the time this movie premiered. It was like watching a ghost on screen, an apparition slightly displaced in time just two blocks away. But it's doubtful the audience even noticed, or if they did, they didn't care. The building had been sacrificed to the war effort and for war-weary people who wanted it all over and done with, that was okay.
On October 9, 1942, the Federal Wrecking Company of Chicago sent its crew to the top of the building to start bashing away at the 50-ton copper roof. This view from an old news clipping of some of the wreckers standing at the top of the tower gives us an idea of just how massive it was. A photo taken at the time shows Mayor Wyatt wielding a piece of steel from the ventilation system, the first official piece removed from the building. A wrecking crew supervisor expressed astonishment at the amount of metal and other material inside. I've never seen anything like it, he said. In October, five marble fireplace mantles from the building were sold to Mr. D.B. Corman of Harrodsburg, Kentucky, who said he'd use them in his new home. Notice the carved patterns on the left of the mantle. This photo of the old mantle in Postmaster Baker's office in 1898, though faint, shows similar patterns. The mantles were sold for only $20 each. One of the first things to go was the one-ton clock mechanism in the tower, deemed useless and worthless. The clock that postal foreman Frank J. Doss had lovingly tried to keep going almost a decade before was sold off for a mere $11. In November 1942, the wrecking crew ransacked the interior. By December, most of the roof was wrecked. Snow slowed the work a bit that winter, but in January 1943, the chimneys came down and part of the tower was dismantled. In February and March 1943, the top floor was demolished. Many of the public were concerned over the fate of the majestic 30-foot columns, the ones worker Philip Huddy had lovingly helped sculpt. They were offered for sale, but no one could find a way to haul them away. This photograph shows us what happened to them. In March, destruction of the superstructure proceeded. A 4,000-pound crane with a 75-foot boom began to batter away at the thick and solid walls. Ironically, just as in the building of the place, some workers were injured on a scaffold. In May, the wreckers were still at it. They were two months over schedule and retailers on the street were getting impatient with the dust, the noise, and the obstructions. It was a familiar tune from 50 years ago when the building took its time getting built. It was hard to build and now hard to destroy. Romantics would say it was issuing a curse. In June 1943, a sudden windstorm blew down the scaffolding at the site. The wrecking company was complaining of a manpower shortage endemic during the war for slowing down the job. Meanwhile, war scrap from the demolition was going to area factories such as tube turns in West Louisville, turned into plane and submarine parts. For a short while, the half-demolished building became a curio and even an inspiration of sorts. Artists set up easels nearby and began to paint it. A government film crew used the ruins as the backdrop for a civil defense newsreel, the building standing in for bombed-out London. Singer-actress Carol Bruce and a soldier used the ruin as backdrop for a publicity stunt. The odd rituals around the building continued. In August 1943, nearly a year after the demolition began, Mayor Wyatt and a government official opened the cornerstone and amused themselves and the press over its unremarkable contents old newspapers, a city directory, and a bottle of apple cider, not bourbon, as expected. The Courier-Journal joked about it, suggesting that a worker long ago had taken the good stuff and switched it out. In November 1943, the demolition job that was supposed to take six months had taken 13. Residents with trucks were urged to come to the site and haul away as much as they could, for the chance to vulture the remaining fine wood, metal, and stone. Federal wrecking never quite finished the job, and the city fought them over the flawed demolition. The company was supposed to remove the structure to about a foot below the ground, but they never came close, leaving a hulking mound for the city to deal with. Eventually, the city had to pay someone else to finish the job. Henry Bossmeyer of St. Matthews was moved to write, the demolition of the old post office I consider little short of a crime. That magnificent structure was so built it could have stood there for several hundred years. Why was it not taken care of and used? The old Lincoln Park, the tiny parcel that had sat just north of the Custom House on Guthrie Street for many years, was expanded to take up the whole block. It, though, like the Custom House, did not last very long. 
By 1950, out-of-state businesses, including J.C. Penney and J.J. Newberry stores, got the land for new stores. In September 1944, returning from the Battle of Saipan in the Pacific, local soldier Corporal Robert E. Kilkelly took a stroll through the new Lincoln Park. The first thing he noticed was the absent building. I couldn't believe it at first, he said. So Sunday, I walked through the park to prove it was real. In 1948, a reader wrote to the newspaper about the impending demise of the newly expanded park. We lost that gem of architecture, the old post office. Must we bid a sad adieu to, to that last bit of green in our downtown? In 1950, J.J. Newberry began to dig a new foundation for a store on 4th Street, but it hit an obstacle. The rubble and the foundation of the old post office. The old girl was having one last laugh. Thank <laughs> you.